Hello, everyone. This is Martin Patilla from Life Enthusiast. Today is October 2nd, 2022. On the previous talk that I did, I was talking about the uh, most common way of leaving this life early, prematurely, and the cause of that would be cardiovascular. That would be heart, heart attack or blood pressure or issues that cardio as in heart and vascular as in arteries and uh, veins. Well, today is the second of the most popular ways to go, which is collectively known as cancer. What's really interesting is this. The cancer industry, since um, it was President Nixon who declared war on cancer, and allocated billions and billions of dollars into war on cancer and decided that we're going to eradicate it. Since that time, nothing has changed. Every day between 1500 and 1600 Americans die of cancer. Now imagine 15 or 1600 people every day, right? If we had that uh, kind of life loss from an infectious disease, we would be making a big fuss about it. Much, I mean, it's more than what we have ever assigned to um, to this latest infectious disease crisis, right? <clears throat> anyway, so we do have more detection. That's what they have managed to accomplish. the The accomplishment has been that we have earlier detection. So we have more cases of cancer that we are tracking. So it looks as though we're having some success. But the death rate, the number of people we're losing to cancer has not changed. It still is above 1500 and has been since 1990 that I have some numbers for. In fact, I'm going to share with you a, um, a report it's on YouTube. Uh, there's a wonderful researcher, Dr. Thomas Seyfried, and I'll, I'll share with you that you can watch it. It's, it's very educational. It's a bit too technical, so most people will probably lose interest, but it's really very educational. Um, okay, so cancer. Number one, I want to say this. We at Life Enthusiast or myself as a health coach do not cure anything. I do not offer a cure for cancer. I do not even offer that I can heal anyone from cancer. What I can offer is an explanation how cancer comes about and what a person can do to change that. You may remember this line, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. That's what we're doing here. And we need to make a decision whether cancer is a genetic disease or a metabolic disease. And if it were a genetic disease, then there's a gene that you inherit from your parents and that gene will cause you to get cancer. And we have a glowing example of, for example, Angelina Jolie some time ago having her breasts cut off because uh, she was diagnosed to have the BRCA, it's sometimes pronounced BRCA, but it stands for breast cancer, BRCA gene. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, Sure, she will have definitely prevented getting breast cancer by having her breasts taken away. But uh, you, you can find it in that Dr. Seyfried lecture is that the researchers have documented that and done this is where they would take a nucleus from a cancerous cell and transplant that nucleus into a normal cell and then make it develop. That should cause that cell to become cancerous. 
but it doesn't. On the other hand, if you transplant a healthy nucleus into a cancerous cell, that cell does not become normal, it stays cancerous. So the logical conclusion from that is that it's the other parts of the cell, the metabolic bits, the mitochondria, that are responsible. Somebody says in the chat, can you turn up your volume? You know, my volume is always the same and nobody complains other than you. So I'm just messing around with it a little bit here, but I don't know if that's changed anything. Um, okay, so cancer. It happens with a cell that switches from respiration to fermentation. Respiration is where energy conversion, as in the Krebs cycle, turns glucose into, uh, okay, one, oh gosh, somebody agrees. I don't know what to do with you people because uh, I can take the mic closer to my face. Um, but this probably has to do with how the volume is recorded in, uh, in this application. Because I don't have any controls over the specific volume there. You know, like there in this application that, that I'm recording with, there isn't really any control over the volume itself. Microphone. I'm just fiddling with my microphone now. And uh, access to this, da, 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 choose microphone, general and volume. I'm, I'm using Windows and there is no control for the volume that I can find. Um, nope. Nothing. I can control the volume of my speaker, but I cannot control the volume of my microphone. What to do? Yep. All right. So sorry. You're going to have to put up with this. See this? That's the microphone right there. Eight inches from my face. So what I started saying is the following. Um, when a cell is converting food into energy, there are two modalities. One is called respiration and the other one is called fermentation. Fermentation is the more primitive, the, more, the older way of converting food into energy. That's, that's uh, happening or was happening before there was sufficient oxygen on the planet because it's not done through oxidation, it's done through fermenting. And what that is, is uh, the output is not carbon dioxide, the output is lactic acid. And you may be familiar with it, like when, when, for example, when you try to ride your bicycle at maximum speed or when you try to lift weights or doing some exercise like repetitions, like lifting dumbbells or doing squats or whatever, you can cause yourself to overrun your oxygen capacity. And when that happens, your muscles will start cramping, stiffening, because the lactic acid is now spilling out or accumulating all over the tissues. In fact, that's what a person who has cancer all over their body will experience when the, uh, the cancer is like all over everywhere. Uh, the person will have lactic acid spilling throughout the body and will be cramping and will be hurting and and that's when uh, they start administering morphine to try and make that person feel a little less terrible, less pain. 
respiration, on the other hand, is um, the way where um, the um, the energy is converted completely, and glucose turns into carbon dioxide, and we get rid of carbon dioxide by respiration, exhale, right? We're exhaling carbon dioxide. And we do that in collaboration with plants, because plants will use sunshine, sunshine and carbon dioxide to store um, energy in the form of carbon in their bodies. And that's, that's how we interact, right? The plants will take the carbon and store it, and we then eat the plant and we'll take the carbon and convert it into energy and exhale carbon dioxide. Anyway, um, Otto Warburg, W-A-R-B-O-R-G, back in the 30s, 1930s, explained that cancer has thousands of secondary causes, but only a single primary cause. And the primary cause is that the cell switches permanently from respiration to fermentation. And researchers have discovered that indeed the cancerous cell has a damaged uh, mitochondria. Like in mitochondria are these little organelles within the cell, cytoplasm, within the cell, that are responsible for converting food into energy, converting ATP out of ADP, right? Adenosine diphosphate converts into triphosphate to store energy, and then back we release the energy when the ATP is used up and converted into ADP again. So the organelles, the mitochondria themselves, are damaged. And when that becomes permanent, irreparable, that cell will have gone to the dark side, quote unquote, permanently. There is a process in the human body called apoptosis. And this apoptosis uh, is driven or run by the immune system. And the immune system is checking every single cell. Each cell is uh, has a marker on it. It's sort of as if I were wearing a necklace, right? And if the necklace color was red, that would mean I'm sick. If it was orange, that's I'm sick, but I'm repairable. And green would be I'm fine. And so this uh, immune system checks the marker on the outside of the cell and says, you're normal, carry on, you're not normal, fix me. And uh, the third one was, you're not normal and not repairable, shut it off, break it down, consume it, turn it into liquid, and then through cell division, replace that with a healthy cell. Now, in the case of a tumor, in case of cancer, cancer has this protective system where it is hiding the marker. It's sort of like a wolf in a sheep's clothing, right? Like if I could hide the necklace, then the immune system can't tell which I am. And it's the same mechanism that's used in the placenta in a pregnant woman. The placenta and the baby are, in fact, foreign bodies that should be seen as not me and should be taken offline. But, of course, there's this protective mechanism that allows for the mother to carry the child to mm -hmm. let the fetus develop. And the cancer cell will use that same protective hiding mechanism to uh, say, yes, I'm foreign, but leave me alone. I belong here. And the apoptosis is the process by which we can, in fact, turn up the volume. Maybe, you know, how should we describe it? It's like have a brighter flashlight. And so when I shine the brighter light, I will be able to tell that there's this actually is a cancerous cell and that it should get shut off. So I, um, I actually have written a, um, an article that's uh, 
very much about that. I'll, I'll just I'll just go through that. In it, I say the word cancer has got such a ring to it, filled with dread. But it should not be that way, despite the false messages in the mainstream media about there being no cure for it, or us not knowing what causes it. There is a cure, and uh, we know what causes it, and I just went over that. And what, what we're saying here is that you, as a person seeking health, is needing to take a very active role in the process. And uh, you, you need to essentially take control. You cannot expect for someone else to do it for you. Um, so it, if, in my message, I say this, if you want a push button easy, do it for me, help from an expert, a guy with a lab coat and a stethoscope around his neck, then you're going to get the level of success that's associated with the mainstream therapies. And they have statistics for that. They'll tell you, you have six months to go, or you have two years to go, or whatever, your life expectation is less than five years, and so on. And if you get better, it will be despite, not because of the care that you'll receive. So in general, cancer has two forms, defined and contained tumors like breast, colon, uterine, prostate, liver, and systemic, like leukemia, lymphoma, the ones that are essentially throughout the body. Uh, the cause of cancer is known for both cases, but it's, in, it's ignored. So, quoting 1966 speech of uh, Otto Warburg in Germany. There are primary and secondary causes of disease. For example, the primary cause of the plague is the plague bacillus. But secondary cause of the plague is filth, rats, and the fleas that transfer the plague bacillus from a rat to the man. By the primary cause of a disease, I mean one that is found in every case of the disease. And cancer, above all other diseases, has countless secondary causes. Almost anything can cause cancer. But even for cancer, there's only one primary cause. The primary cause of cancer is the replacement of the respiration of oxygen or oxidation of sugar. It should be oxidation of glucose in normal body cells by fermentation of the glucose. And I can post you the link to the whole lecture if you want to, uh, if you want to go and spend the time on that. So the primary problem, absence of oxygen in the body fluids. So the cells will switch from respiration to fermentation and the cancer will grow very much like a yeast that is fermenting a jug of wine. The cancer is in the whole body, but it forms visible tumors only at some sites, typically the weakest links in the physiology. Um, so now what causes the deficit in oxygenation? It's the pH balance of the fluids. The oxygen carrying capacity is inversely proportional to the acidity of the fluids. Now this is for the, uh, solid tumors like the um, like the liver or breast or uterine and so on. What's interesting is that the uh, over acidity lowers the oxygen level. That's the acidic fluids. The over alkalinity would give rise to um, leukemia or lymphoma and the likes. So either way, we have the um, pH balance that's supposed to be at optimal at 7.35 on the pH scale or negative 25 millivolt on the ORP scale. So if you go too far acidic, you're going to be losing oxygen carrying capacity. 
So the blood, your blood, is maintained in a fairly narrow range at the expense of the lymphatic extracellular fluids in which the excess ions are being buffered. So this cancer is an illness of too much acidity and acid fluids carry much less oxygen. And when the oxygen level drops by 35%, the cell will switch from respiration to fermentation permanently. So what causes this acidity? Metabolic processes in the body and ingestion of toxins, that's what. There are four major metabolic types. Two of them tend to get acidic. One of them is alkalized by intake of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, and they will respond well to the Gerson or the Ornish diet. And then the other one is alkalized by high protein, high fat diet of the hunters. And that responds well to the Johanna Budwig dietary protocol. And if you, if you listen to Thomas Seyfried's uh, lecture, he will talk about calor caloric restriction and keto di ketogenic diets. What's important is this. The cancer cell will, is, <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> cancer cell is an obligate glucose metabolizer. It will take the glucose before any other cell will get at, get at it. <clears throat> this means that any circulating glucose will feed the cancer cell first. A healthy human cell is capable of uh, using fat for energy. Butyrate, right? Hydrox hydroxymethylbutyrate, HMB. Whereas a um, cancer cell cannot use that. So when you do a cal caloric restriction, which means that you will um, eat a salad with a piece of meat, that's how you will be able to survive, but the cancer cell will suffer or will be reduced in its ability to feed itself and will just simply reduce, wither away. So this is somewhat related to the metabolic typing that, that I'm trained in and practice. And that's this, right? S some people uh, are alkalized by fats, that's the oxidizers. Some people are alkalized by carbohydrates, that's the uh, autonomics. But either way, um, you need to be eating the diet that's appropriate for your genetics. That's the, that's the genetic component. But the mechanism by which this happens is strictly metabolic. So once you know your metabolic type, you will know what will alkalize you. And so you can uh, get into that. Now, Here's what happens, right? Like people talk about alkalize, alkalize or die. And in the books, you will read that, that certain foods are alkalizing and certain, certain foods are acidifying. Most of these books were written without the understanding of metabolic typing and without the understanding that the uh, oxidizers have it backwards in their body. That oxidizer is in fact alkalized by fats and proteins whereas the autonomic is made acidic by them. So the autonomic will do great when they put themselves on a diet that's mostly vegetarian, but still is reduced in calories. So vegetarian, as in lots of salad and lots of healthy fat, like butter or ghee or coconut oil or olive oil, that sort of thing. Whereas the um, hunter, the oxidizer, they will do better with meat and animal fats and that sort of thing. Now, it's not, it's not difficult to alkalize a body forcibly externally, right? Like you can take baking soda, which is the most alkalizing mineral, and you can start drinking 
take a teaspoon of baking soda, put it in a glass of water and drink it between meals. The trouble with the baking soda is that if you take it with a meal, you instantly alkalize the stomach content and you cause the undigested food to uh, leave the stomach for small intestine. So you need to make sure that when you do the baking soda, you take it well ahead of eating a meal. There's one other thing that uh, is very anti-cancer, which is iodine. Iodine is helping with mucosal barriers and it's helping the cells with metabolic functions. This is really important, right? The metabolic rates and the Krebs cycle, which is the, uh, you, can, you can do some research into that. Krebs cycle is the steps through which the ATP is made out of the ADP and how the energy circulates through the body. And iodine is involved in controlling this process. So you need to have a sufficient amount of iodine for that. So to, to explain it or to summarize it this way, cancer exists in an oxygen deprived terrain. Oxygen carrying capacity decreases as fluids become acidic. The genetic disruption is amplified in cells that are compromised by stored toxins. This should be emphasized that plastics or fire retardants or gassing off from dashboards in your new automobile or and especially heavy metals like lead, mercury, cadmium and the likes, they are definitely contributing to the genetic disruption. So you can push more oxygen into the fluids, but the fluids won't carry it. The, the, the pushing, well, you can do it with um, oxygen, ozone or hydrogen peroxide, right? Like you can put drops of hydrogen peroxide directly in the water you drink, or you can do ingestion in injections, like you can do intravenous treatments. And these are done uh, in naturopathic offices. You can go in and have either ozone treatment or hydrogen peroxide treatment directly on your blood. They will just uh, take some of the blood out of the body, treat it and push it back in. Another popular one is oxychlor, known as MMS, because that releases a lot of oxidation into the body. And we have a uh, uh, another one called Fulton uh, Mix. It's uh, offered at Life Enthusiast as uh, amazing O. That thing is also pushing large amounts of oxygen into circulation. And you can also use hyperbaric treatment, right? Like you can get into a hyperbaric chamber that will increase the pressure with which you're pushing oxygen in. But the body fluids will not carry it. So we can push the pH toward alkalinity with minerals, right? Like we can use baking soda, or you may have heard of cesium chloride, or you can use uh, mineralization like calcium, magnesium. I mentioned uh, a while ago that the um, body fluid is becoming more acidic and it's becoming buffered or it's getting buffered with minerals and the buffering mineral that is stored uh, or that is used is the calcium that is stored in the bones. And you may have seen or heard that uh, people with advancing or advanced stages of cancer will start dissolving their bones. Their ribs will start dissolving or their hips and so on, right? And this is actually common to other problems, right? When, when your acidity is rising, the stored calcium is being taken out of the bones and put into circulation. So the osteopenia or osteoporosis is a, a reflection of the acidity of the body and, and the taking off the mineral and putting it into circulation. You're not any lighter than 
the calcium is still in your body. It's circulating in the fluids, buffering the toxins. So uh, the acidifying process, we can uh, certainly switch it by understanding metabolic typing and switch the meals in such way that the body is becoming more alkalized. So this is important to note. If you're an oxidizer, the food that will alkalize you most is fat. If you are an autonomic, the food that will alkalize you most is carbohydrate. So you will have a challenge of managing that because uh, you also at the same time want to create low caloric or restriction of calories so that the body is forced to using fat as the source of energy. So that would mean that we would want to be eating a diet that's based heavily on raw enzyme rich foods because they will support um, the cellular turnover and they will support apoptosis. And we do have available apoptosis rich supplements. So step one, removing toxins. Heavy metals, they are best taken out with zeolite. It's important that you bind and retrieve. So that, that would be for cadmium, lead, mercury, cesium, uranium. The other thing that really works well is either sodium alginate, which is an extract from seaweed, or we have been quite successfully using high pectin apple fiber. And you will see that many conditions respond really well to modified pectin or high pectin. Pectasol is such a product that's on the market. The other thing that's been known to help a lot with this detoxification is glutathione. Glutathione is the means by which your liver is neutralizing toxic things or toxins out of the body. The trouble with glutathione is that ingesting it straight is uh, somewhat challenging because the digestive system will take it apart. When it's ingested in the liposomal delivery system, then that, that's quite workable. And we do have liposomal glutathione available. Or you can also deliver it rectally. There's a phenomenal product that we have. It's called Xenoplex, which is a suppository. And that's, uh, that's a combination of caffeine and the glutathione. And when you deliver that, it's absorbed into the blood, quickly heading into the liver and causing the liver detox. Uh, the natural way of doing this is known as the coffee enema. The coffee enema is uh, kind of different. You take uh, lightly roasted coffee, preferably organic, and you boil it. You boil it like for 15, 20 minutes. And when, then, then you let it come to a uh, room temperature or body temperature, which is around 100 degrees. And then you push it rectally as a retention enema. You would want to get at least pint, a pint, but if you have it done in a clinical setting, they'll probably try and use a whole quart of it. And then you, well, hold it as long as possible. Uh, we can talk about that some other time. But anyway, so you push this fluid internally, and once that's in your colon, it gets absorbed and pushed directly into the liver, and it causes the liver to detoxify, to dump its toxins. So for example, in the Gerson clinics, they would be doing at least two coffee enemas every day. Mm -hmm. So enzymes, yeah, we definitely need enzymes, digestive enzymes and pancreatic enzymes, systemic enzymes. Well, all of the enzymes, enzymes are helping to break apart things 
food, organic things. So a digestive enzyme will help to break apart, break apart things that you're ingesting, right? Amylase will break apart starch. Protease will break apart um, proteins. Lipase will do that to fats. The most popular ones are bromelain from uh, pineapple, papain from papaya, but then the other ones I mentioned as well. And uh, but there are there are others, right? There are enzymes that will digest uh, lactose and gal galactose and uh, and uh, fiber and so on. And then there are enzymes that are known as uh, systemic. So, for example, serapeptase is the fibrinogenic or fibrinol. No, pardon me. I should say fibrinolytic lysis lytic. That, that talks about uh, taking things apart. So fibrinolytic enzyme will dissolve fibrin or fibrin, which is uh, the scar tissue in the body. And of course, every tumor is covering itself with a, um, it's sort of like a skin, right? It's a, it's a, in, a containment area. And uh, when you increase intake of fibrinolytic enzymes, you're going to be taking apart the um, the covering. And of course, pushing pancreatic enzymes is very useful because that helps with um, digestion and or decomposition of all tissues that are supposed to be decomposed. We are trying to yeah, break apart all of the tumors that are within the body. So here's my uh, here's my step by step recommendation list. Uh, yeah, I, I'm realizing that I'm taking a bit of an extreme position, but I would expect and understand that you could cave to the fear and uncertainty and doubt that the uh, medical mainstream or your relatives will push on you. But here goes one surgery. Mm, okay, it's okay, but in the long run, you cannot cut out something that's a systemic problem. Two, radiation. It's another method of trying to kill cells. So when you're radiating, you're killing the localized growth. But you cannot create healthy cells by burning them. So if you're going to do that, you also should be taking these fibrinolytic enzymes because you will have created a lot of scar tissue. And it's actually counterintuitive, but it's this. When cells are coming apart post-radiation, they are actually creating a lot of um, glutamic acid or glucosamine, which is in fact energy that the cancer cells can use. So by radiating, you're in fact feeding cancer cells. My opinion is that you can spare yourself the chemotherapy because since when is more poison a solution for too much toxicity? Um, start alkalizing with minerals. You can use something like the uh, neutralizer or baking soda or sulfur salts. Those are very effective. Definitely add iodine because it will upregulate your uh, ability to uh, correctly metabolize, right? Support your thyroid, support your uh, metabolic Krebs cycle in the, in the cells. Definitely find out your metabolic type so that you know whether you should be on a strictly vegetarian diet or whether you should be on a uh, ketogenic hunter diet. <coughs> Definitely eat a lot of raw food. Definitely eat a lot of uh, enzyme rich food. <coughs> 
support apoptosis, elagitanins, right? There's a ton of research done on elagic acid, which is coming from elagitanins, which is coming from specific seeds. The most popular ones are raspberry, but others are there too. We we have products that that are a combination of uh, well treated extracts from seeds that will uh, help you with that. <clears throat> What's interesting is this: when you crack the um, raspberry seed, you're exposing its protected core to the elements, right? Like that. And what happens? is um, it oxidizes quickly, it becomes rancid, and it loses its capacity fairly quickly. So when we do that, when we mill the seed, we mill it in the combination with antioxidants and, and uh, emulsifiers. So when you emulsify and put antioxidants right in there, you are actually protecting it from becoming rancid. That's, that's how we do that. So. Uh, you can expect that the product we make is going to be way more effective, and it is. And then make sure that you detoxify, right? We have been recommending zeolite for that, and uh, um, we have another product that we have added to the to the lineup. It's called Folium. You can look it up. And then drink a lot of water and try to get water that's been filtered of toxins, definitely rid of chlorine, and uh, perhaps definitely structured, right? I have talked about the um, ways of structuring the water. It can be done through vortexing, where you're spinning the water clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise. You can do that yourself, right? Like you can be spinning the water clockwise, counterclockwise. It just is... That, that will structure it. Or you can use one of these ceramics that are helping to break apart the clustering, which increases the water's uh, ability to hydrate by decreasing the surface tension and decreasing the cluster size. More hydration, more washing out of the toxins and better absorption of the nutrients. One other thing that we have used quite effectively is called Ionic Foot Spa. Ionic Foot Spa is, is sort of like electroplating, but for a human body, right? When you electroplate something, like for example, if you are wanting to um, do chrome plating, chrome plating of a part, you put it on a negative electrode and the positive electrode is sending the material that you want to deposit and the negative electrode is attracting it. <clears throat> you can do the same thing with the human body. You put your feet in water that's got some salt in it and uh, you turn on the direct current and whatever electropositive stuff is in your feet is going to get pulled through the skin out into the bath decreasing the toxicity of your lymphatic fluid. And movement. Movement is important, right? One of the banes of human existence is stagnation. So exercising on a rebounder, or if you can't exercise uh, using a vibration machine, a vibrating plate, up, down, up, down. What we need is we need the lymphatic movement. So. Of course, lymphatic massage would also help. But we need movement in order for the fluids to not stagnate. So that's pretty much what comes to mind when I'm describing it. So I'm going to say, let's, let's just see what questions there are. Kevin says, isn't inflammation the root of most disease? Then possibly all nutrient that decrease, decrease inflammation. Well, so that's an interesting concept, right? Like inflammation is actually a symptom of cellular renewal, right? Like when your body is trying to repair something, 
it will use the inflammation. There are five symptoms to inflammation, which is redness, heat, swelling, pain, and loss of function. And that's, so it's not the cause, it's the effect, right? So I wouldn't say that that's the root cause of anything. It's a, it's an important symptoms of everything. <laughs> so then uh, Nancy says, what about apricot seed, vitamin B17? Yes, that's, that's been shown to be very helpful. Um, the, uh, the effect is cyanide, the effect is toxic. So it will, when ingested, it will help to kill off weak cells. The cancer cell is weaker than others. And with that, the, um, yeah, the vitamin B12, I mean, it's been, it's been shown to be effective. And uh, then of course, uh, this, <laughs> I remember this fellow whose name I can't recall, who started selling apricot seeds on the internet because he was helped so much. And the next thing that happened is he was put in jail for five years for practicing medicine without license. Go figure. But yeah, apricot seeds. I have collected a jar of apricot seeds thinking, well, I'll do something with it. Those seeds are really hard. The shells, I should say, are really hard to break. Real pain. And the, the apricot seed itself is bitter as heck, not fun to eat. All right, so then the question is, what's the best diet for the acidic autonomic body? Well, if you're an autonomic dominant, then you would be alkalized by starches and you'd be acid acidified by fats and proteins. So you would want to be on a vegetarian diet that's got some fat in it and the amount of protein is somewhat low. That's, that's how you do it. I used the amazing soak in a bath. You can really smell the chlorine in the bath water. Does that affect how the soak works? <clears throat> Actually, what you are smelling is the hypochlorous acid that is part of this product. You see, here's the interesting bit about the, uh, about the amazing soak. It is releasing hypochlorous acid, which is the same acid that your white blood cell would release in order to try and neutralize an invading uh, organism in your body. That's what it does. And uh, the hypochlorous acid will release the extra oxygen. And that's how the ROS, reactive oxygen species, is released into circulation. So, yeah, that's exactly how it's working. It will smell chlorine-like. Laurie's writing. My brother had radiation treatment for a melanoma tumor on his face. And it created a crater that's on his face that's seeping. Do you think that neutralizer spray will help heal it? Well, if I were to use any one thing on a seeping injury, I would be using the product by Skin Sorcery and it's called Trauma Gel. Here, I have it right here. I use it on any open wounds. It's called Trauma, T-R-A-U-M-A -A gel. Put it on. Um, would ivermectin? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, ivermectin, as far as I know, is antiparasitic. I don't have any opinion on whether it would or wouldn't help with a uh, seeping wound on the face. I, I don't think directly, no. And another question, does amazing O diluted in water taken preventively? A good idea. Well, so the amazing O, I have used it swished around my mouth 
to deal with bacteria, especially periodontal or bad breath or whatever. Swished around the mouth, I would put a couple of drops in a teaspoon of water and just do it like that. When you swallow it, it's actually killing off microbes. So I don't think it's smart to be using it all the time. That's just not, not a good idea. Like if you want to kill a specific infection, yes, but otherwise not. Likewise, you can inhale it, right? I make the 2% uh, solution of the amazing O, put it in the sprayer and I inhale it. I do that anytime I feel I may have been in contact with something out there that might be infectious. It works rather well. Inhalation through either nebulizer or a uh, diffuser, probably, or even a humidifier. That might be useful. But again, um, I don't think that it's wise to be killing off an infection if you don't have one. Right? Like using this preventively is not really a smart idea. I would only use it when needed. And Nancy says, I heard that a researcher found that parasites cause cancer. Um, maybe. What I would say is that people who were taking ivermectin have found that their cancer uh, symptoms were reduced or that they were getting less trouble with it, as in like healing from cancer from taking ivermectin. So that would follow and support that case. I would say that a body attacked by parasites is weaker. I don't know which, which one is the chicken and the egg here. Is it that a weak body is attacked by, can, uh, by parasites or is it that parasites weaken the body and make it even weaker, weaker still? So removing parasites in all cases, I'm sure is an intelligent thing to do. Patricia's asking, how would one determine pH? Some people think that uh, checking the urine is a good idea. The urine is, is a disposal, right? So when you check the pH of your urine, you're watching what's being dumped. So if the urine is alkaline, you're dumping alkaline minerals. If the urine is acidic, you're dumping acidic minerals. It only tells you what your body's getting rid of. I would say that the best way to do this is to use a, a pH strip and check your saliva, just right there under the tongue. First thing in the morning, before you brush your teeth and before you start thinking about food, because I tell you, all you have to do, and you can demonstrate it to yourself with your pH strip, is start thinking about lemons, or start thinking about, um, oh, just about any food, and the pH of your saliva will change just in reflection to what you're thinking about. HM, is ozone therapy good for acidic autonomic body? Well, so I'll take you back to the uh, paragraph that I was saying not that long ago, which is this. You can push oxygen into the body, but the fluids will not carry it until you correct the pH balance itself. So you would be better off focusing on correcting your pH balance through the nutrition and only then pushing the oxygen. It will be much more effective. You can do ozone therapy. Ozone therapy typically is done either by uh, ozonating your blood or by insufflation, which would mean that you will be inserting a uh, plastic hose that's bubbling the uh, ozone rectally. Women can do it vaginally. You definitely don't want to inhale it because it's going to injure your lungs. 
yeah, I'm I'm thinking that it would be more effective and better idea for you to uh, to focus on just simply doing it with food. Um, Victoria, what about fibroid tumor? Well, fibroid tumor is not cancerous; it's fibroid, and we do have fibrinolytic enzymes. Um, we have on our website Zymetol and we have Vitalzyme. They both will work on that. You need to go for a fairly high dose. Like, for example, with the Zymetol, they say on the bottle, take three a day for maintenance. I would go for finding the activation dose. There is an article on the website. If you search on activation dose, you'll find it. And uh, it varies. Some people need nine, some people need 12, even even 18 a day. Anyway, once you reach the activation dose, you sustain that for about six weeks and most everything that's um, of fibroid sort will get dissolved. I remember a fun story, a woman asked to do this and called back after three months and said, okay, the fibroid Tumor is gone, but you know what? All of my stretch marks are gone too. And that's the interesting part, right? Like if you look at stretch mark, it's a scar tissue from pulling apart of the um, underlying structures in the skin. So when you dissolve the fibrosis or the fibroid, the scar tissue, even the stretch marks are gone. Is Amazing O and Colloidal Silver do the same thing? In, in parts. So Colloidal Silver is unfriendly toward uh, primitive life forms. That would be um, fungal, bacterial, amoebal, viral. So when you ingest Colloidal Silver, it will block their ability to metabolize oxygen, which essentially makes them die. The amazing O is another way of doing it. It's pushing free oxygen into the tissue. So one is more like you take away their oxygen and choke them. The other one is by pushing aggressively oxygen and burning them. So the end result is similar, but how you get there is the opposite. And Patricia is wondering about metabolic type. So yes, there are articles on the website. All, all you have to do is just type the word metabolic into the search box. It'll uh, it'll deliver it to you. I'm going to um, copy it in here. Just you know the basic basic article. Uh, I'm going to copy that in. But you want to. Um, you you want to read more. I've, I've done several lectures on it. Like if you go into the podcasts and uh, search on metabolic, you'll find three or four different podcasts that each of which will address that. Well, Laurie, you can't be in the middle of both, right? Like if you take metabolic typing, you may find yourself to be balanced, but you will be either a balanced oxidizer, it's called mixed oxidizer or balanced autonomic. So if you're halfway between this and that, it still is that one will make you more alkaline, the other will make you more acidic. So the experiment would be this. Do yourself a glucose challenge, which means, for example, a bowl of uh, porridge with a glass of orange juice it's just straight carb, right? Now, if that takes you closer to acidity, which would be irritation or impatience or anxiety, that's acidity, then you would know that glucose makes you more acidic. And then you can do the opposite challenge, which is take a spoonful of coconut oil and just lick it right off the spoon. And if that makes you more alkaline, which is 
more peaceful, more lethargic, more sleepy, less irritable, then now you would know you're an oxidizer. Fats are calming and car carbs are stimulating. Yeah. Or the other way around. You need to decide which you are. You cannot be both. Will amazing O help with UTIs? Very likely, yes. Yeah, I would, I would definitely give that a go. I would swallow about 12 drops of the amazing O in a bit of water two, three days in a row. And how often should I use amazing O as maintenance? I would only use it if it's needed. I don't think that there's such a thing as maintenance. I only use it when I have a problem, when I'm out of balance. Whatever symptoms you have that, that you would consider. I mean, if you have a flu, that's when you use it for sure. Or if you're coming down with something, right? The beginnings of the flu. Um, more oxygen in the blood. Mm. I would go with metabolic typing before I would start to uh, push it with, with artificial things. Fix it. If, if you're thinking that you need more oxygen in the blood, correct your blood pH. Don't try to push oxygen. First fix the pH balance. All right. So this, this is Martin Catella, the health coach at Life Enthusiast, coming to you today, October 2nd, 2022. Um, you can find me at life-enthusiast.com and by phone at 1-866-543-3388. Thank you for being here today. See you in a week.